lost in the military. Um, we, uh, and when we, I was in the region down there, and we put up flags and stuff, and the weather was nice. It was a, it was a very somber time, but I'm kind of going off of that a little bit because the military stuff kind of comes to mind this time of year, things coming back around. So we're going to talk a little bit about being a soldier for Christ. And that's in this letter of 2 Timothy, Paul is talking to, to Timothy, and he kind of gives what would have been really good advice to any soldier. When I was in, this is stuff we would have heard. And this is, this is the concept that we are in a battle, and when we accept Christ, we joined up. We enlisted. We weren't drafted. We enlisted. We choose this. And if we choose this, this is the life we're going to live. So before we get started, let's just go to the Lord in prayer again. Father, I thank you so much for this day and for those that are gathered here today, Lord. I thank you for your word and the message that, that you have for us. And I just pray, Lord, you give me the words that you want spoken. Make this something that embeds itself in our hearts and, and gives us the energy and the strength and the commitment to go forward, Lord. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All, all week, um, God's been speaking to me about hesitation. And that's something that I think we all struggle with sometimes. We can see the door open, we see something that's necessary, and we hesitate. We hesitate to take that step. And then 2020 hindsight later, we go, oh, should have done that. Should have made, should have made that step forward. And that's something that, um, in a military context, that's something that can be deadly. There, you need to be committed 100% and be able to move 100% and be able to go forward without thinking. That's part of your training is that you just commit yourself. Once you get started, you commit yourself. There is a concept, it goes all the way back to, well, the Napoleonic War, maybe before that, of something known as the forlorn hope. And the forlorn hope was if there was a siege or a battle against a fortified position, the artillery would go after the walls. And when there was a breach, when they finally got a hole in the wall, they'd shoot for the weakest spots. And when they finally got a hole in the wall, the necessary thing that happened after that is the soldiers had to charge up that wall. Well, of course, the guys on the inside knew there was a hole. They're going to protect it. But somebody had to charge up that wall before they could get it back up and get a little bit of control, and then eventually the whole army could come in, open the gates, and the walls would fall. Now, to be in a forlorn hope, there was a very high casualty rate. But in most of the armies that you read about, the guys all had to volunteer. Nobody was told they had to do this. You had to volunteer, but if you volunteered and went forward in that and survived it, it was like guaranteed promotion. It was guaranteed promotion. And I want to think about, I think about the world today as being um, Satan's fort. He's fortified, he's all sunk in, he's, he's, he's buried in there and we've got to dig it out. We've got to challenge that and we have to go through it. And hesitation is something that's going to cause problems. It's a lot easier for him to hit a stationary target than a moving one. <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt, one of my favorite presidents, especially for quotes, said this. This is one of my favorite quotes. In any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. And that goes back to our witness and our life as a Christian. If you try and you might do the wrong thing, God will still make something out of that. Obviously, if you try and do the right thing, that's the best thing you can do. But the one thing that God can't work with is us being stationary. Not following through at all, doing nothing. That's God's hard has a hard time working with nothing. So we're going to go into Second Timothy um, right now, verses two through twelve. I'm going to start right away with Second Timothy two one. Paul talking to Timothy says, "You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus." So he starts off right away, "Be strong." Now the the way they use the word strong in this particular passage, if you go to the Greek word, it's an inner strength. He's not talking to him about physically weightlifting, but spiritually weightlifting, spiritually giving himself strong. And to be strong in the grace. Now to be strong in the grace is, is something that we can all grab a hold of. Understanding where we come from will give us strength. 
As an individual, I am nothing. Without him, I am nothing. I am not capable of the mission that's laid out before me. I can't do it, but with him, I'm invincible. There's nothing that can stop us if we're with God. Now, the, the army has gone through many, 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 many different advertising campaigns. But one of them they had was the army of one. There is no possible way you can have an army of one person. It doesn't exist. Each person in the military, each person in the army has hundreds and hundreds of people beside them, in front of them, and behind them. The infantry can't go forward without somebody providing what they call the beans and the bullets. You need supply guys coming along, you need somebody cooking, you need, all that kind of stuff has to be supplied to keep you going. And infantry will need artillery, they will need cavalry, they'll need all those different things. There's all those different working parts that work together. And that God provides that for us too. We have all those different working parts provided for us. All he asks is that we be willing to step out in faith. And through grace, understand that the strength we have comes from Him. If you understand that, then there's no fear. Because we know God can overcome anything, no matter what I do. So that'll help your hesitation a little bit too, when you realize that this isn't me, this is God. When you speak the Word, you're not speaking from yourself, you're speaking from God. This is what God says. That's where your strength comes from. Philippians 4.13, we all know this one. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. <coughs> Go ahead, Pete. Ephesians 6.10, talking about the armor of God, says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I had to laugh this morning. I don't know if anybody else saw it. On Fox News, they had a picture of that. They called it a boulder that landed on that highway in Colorado. Anybody see that? Um... Twice the height of the church and easily the width. Had a man standing in front of him. One big rock right in the middle of the highway. They had a rock slide and that one landed in the highway. And Jane said, Oh. Somebody must have been sitting there and said, I think I'll move that mountain. And dropped one right in the middle of the road. It's just a huge rock. And God says, There's nothing beyond him. And because of that, there's nothing beyond us. He gives us everything he has. Verse 2. We need to share the gospel and the work. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Our mission is not to hoard it, not to keep it to ourselves, but to spread it, and to spread it with the concept of discipling others to take on, to take on the mission. One of the things you learn very quickly in the military is you trust your leaders. But the next thing you learn is that you have to be a leader. You start with someone leading you, and eventually you become that leader. You develop. Over time, you should be leading others. And then those that you lead should then go on to lead someone else. When uh, you get promoted in the military, in the Army, you start enlisted, and you're just a private, a specialist. You're, you're, you don't have any leadership roles. And then eventually you develop to the point where they send you to a school called PLDC, Primary Leadership Development Course, and you become a sergeant or a corporal. You become a non-commissioned officer. And what that means is that you are not going to have people underneath you to take care of you. I went through that in the military, and then when I met Jane, she was studying, because there's tests and stuff you have to take. And the board, you have to go in front of them and do all sorts of things. They'll ask you questions, and you have to know the answers to all the questions. Jane was studying for it. And that's one thing I did with her over there is I helped her study for this test to become a leader. Now, Timothy, we know, was a young man who Paul got started in ministry. And he was a very young man. He had been raised in a godly household, and Paul considered him a son. And he put him out in that position. In 1 Timothy, we see a lot of that. 2 Timothy, now Paul is saying, okay, now you're there. You have these things. Now, create other leaders. Find reliable people that can take it farther. And we're all required in the same way to do those kind of things. Not only do we share, but we disciple. And when we disciple, people learn. And when they learn, eventually they learn enough that they can go out and do what, what the mission is. And when they do that, they disciple the next person. It continues to spread. Pete? 
Jeremiah 23, 28 says, Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream, but let one who has my word speak it faithfully. What has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. There's a rule called a rule of multiplication. D.L. Moody says it's better to train ten people than to do the work of ten people. But it is harder. Any of us that are fathers understand that concept. All of us that are fathers or grandfathers. <coughs> Eventually, you got to let somebody else do the work. You try and do it all yourself, you're going to burn yourself out, there'll be nothing there. You have to share the load. It's harder necessarily not possibly to do that. It's harder to <laughs> trust someone to do it and not have to step out and just say, well, I'll just do it myself. But it's necessary. And here's the rule of that multiplication. If you disciple two people, and they each disciple two people. It only takes 10 iterations before you have 1,024 people discipled from one. It's a triangular thing. It just keeps building as it goes. All you have to do is two. And then they do two. And then those four then do two more. So that's how it multiplies. That's the law of multiplication. It just says if you can take one thing and multiply it, and that, that doubles itself every time it doubles, it only takes 10 steps. That's not 10 generations, that's 10 steps, folks. To get to 1,000 people. Now imagine if everybody in this church discipled two people. How many people that would touch? Again, we can't have hesitation in this. If you want to be a leader, you've got to be, you've got to be strong in your faith, you've got to be strong in, in the grace of God and push yourself forward. Now verse 3 2 Timothy 2, 3 says, says we need to stay faithful when it gets hard. Paul tells Timothy, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier. In other words, we know if this battle is going to get hard. If you are a good soldier, Satan will attack you. You will be challenged. You will be fought against because he doesn't want your testimony to be worthwhile. He can't take your salvation, but he can try and take your testimony. That's all he can do. And I've thought this, I've thought this before, and I, I reevaluate my life on this often. If I am not currently in spiritual warfare, I must not be currently doing my job. If you don't feel like Satan's, Satan's trying to get you, you're probably not worth chasing after right now. The best soldier, the one that's going to be the strongest and doing the most, is going to get the most resistance. We need to be pushing into that resistance. We need to seek the resistance and overcome it. We need to be pushing ourselves forward all the time. And that's when he says, join me in suffering. He said, I'm out here getting attacked. I want you to step beside me. Stand beside me in this attack and push yourself forward. Do this as a good soldier would. There was times when I was in a, in a combat situation where we would get pinned down. We would be in a threatening position. We would be pushed together. And I can tell you, it doesn't take long for you to figure out the guys that are worthwhile and the guys that you're dragging behind you. They're not pulling their weight. I can tell you who, and, and any soldier will tell you, there's somebody. if somebody says, I've got your six, that means I can go forward as hard as I want because he's got my back and nobody's going to sneak up behind me. And it, you learn who those people are and you want to be around them. And Paul's telling Timothy, come stand beside me in this. Let's charge forward. Let's move forward in this. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who loved him. Satan's going to be attacking us. And by not quitting, we win. It's that perseverance. The one who perseveres. If you don't quit, you win. God says we may stumble, but he will keep us from falling. And we will stumble. This is something that I've always tried to teach students, whether it was teaching adults or teaching kids. <clears throat> you know what? You might fall. You might fail. Then you learn from your lesson, you get up and you keep going. A righteous man 
comes back, uh, can fall seven times and stand up seven times. You are meant to push forward. Don't worry about being perfect, just worry about the push. If you stumble, God will pick you up and let you push again. That's what you're meant to do. We're meant to persevere and keep pushing. We can't win by standing still. You can only win by moving forward. Now, verses 4 and 5 kind of go together. I'll put them together. You need to stay focused. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Now, this first part in, in verse 4, I thought was really interesting. <coughs> when we were in the army, they would tell us there is no color. There's no black, there's no white, there's no brown, there's no yellow, we're all green. When you put on the uniform, you become green. So we're all the same. And it was one of those rules in the military, you stayed out of politics. You just stayed out of it. Leave it alone. It's got nothing to do with you. You follow what your commanding officer says and you leave it alone. All of those other things are just like the things in our world that are distractions. They're diversionary tactics put forth by the enemy. If you're pushing this way, he's going to try to make you look over here. While you look over here, you lose your momentum. If we're pushing forward for God, Satan will put things in there that can distract us. Now there's a lot of things in the world that are not evil. I found a quote that I really like. It said, many things in the world may not in themselves be evil, but when our focus goes from the battleground to the playground, they become sin in our lives. Hmm. It may not be something that you think of as, well, there can't be a problem. But if it, if it overwhelms you enough that it takes you <coughs> off mission, that's sin. And that, it doesn't matter what it is. Anything that takes you away, that diverts your attention from God, that pushes you in, the, in an opposite direction from the direction you're meant to go, is a diversionary tactic by Satan. He can use anything against us. Even the innocuous things that don't look bad. He can use that. Beware of the snares that he lays out for us. Beware of the things that don't look like they're dangerous and are. There's a reason we put cheese on a mousetrap. Cheese is not threatening to the mouse. But the trap is still there. Satan will do the same thing. And his temptation may, may look harmless. But if you let it overtake you, then it becomes sin. That becomes the problem. Revelations 3.11 We are meant to hold fast. I am coming soon. Soon, Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Focus on your mission. Stay on target. Don't let that diversion get in your way. I am coming soon. Hold on. Another one, James 1.12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown that the Lord has promised. I'm bringing that one back up again because I think it's that important. Hold on. Stay steady. Keep your focus. If you lose focus, you're going to lose the battle. We don't lose the war. The war is taken care of by God. That's not our issue. We know in the end. We can read the end of the book and it will tell us what's going to happen. But what happens between today, right now, at this moment in time, and that time when Jesus returns, that's our responsibility. You know you're going to win in the end, you push forward. Nobody ever goes into a battle as a soldier thinking they're going to lose. I don't care what the odds are, you go in there thinking, I'm going to win, I'm going to take it, I'm going to, I'm going to get to the prize. That's the same thing it says with the... You, the athlete obeys the rules if he's going to win. If you don't obey the rules, you're not going to win. Simple as that. There's a way of doing this. You do it that way to win. That's what God tells us to do in his word. Now, verse 6, I thought was an interesting one to throw in here because he's talking about soldier, 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 soldier. And then in verse 6, he says, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Well, where did that come from? Well, he's talking about soldiers, and now he says farmer in the middle of this. Well, the farmer, I, I think, comes because it talks about earning your pay. Do your share. There is no farmer out here who bags up a loaf of bread and puts it on a shelf in the grocery store. 
You may plant the wheat, you may harvest the wheat. But just like Henny Penny, somebody else is going to grind it, somebody else is going to bake it, and that's going to put it in there. Everybody has to do their share. You have to do your part. Your part may not be everything. You may have a specific task that you are called to. You may have one specific piece that you are called to. Be good at it. Do the best you can for what you have. That's where you earn your share in this. That's where you do your part. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Jane said this the other day. I think she was talking to Wayne. She said, I don't know how somebody who is a farmer cannot be a Christian. How you cannot believe that God exists if you plant seeds. Because when you put that seed in the ground, you're doing it on faith that it's going to pop up. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can set it up the best way you can. You can do everything you can to, to prep your field and to fertilize and do all the things right and put the best seed <coughs> in you can possibly get. It still doesn't have to happen unless God allows it to sprout and grow. We don't grow plants. We, we plant them. And that's what this passage is talking about. And this passage in 1 Corinthians is talking about, I planted seeds. Somebody else watered them. But God makes it grow. So in that passage in 2 Timothy, it says the hardworking farmers should be the first to receive a share of the crops. You do your share. And let someone else do their share too. Don't think you have to do this all alone. We don't. We are a family of believers. We are a church as a community here. We each have roles to play. Now, if you don't pull your weight, somebody else has to do it. And none of us want to, want to think that somebody else has to pick up our slack. But you don't have to do everything yourself either. As a soldier, it's the same way. You have one area that you focus on. In a situation where you're entrenched in a little bit, they call it your field of fire. In other words, I'm responsible for this area from here to here. Now we have interlocking fields of fire. That means the next guy has about 10 feet into this field of fire, his own field of fire, and about 10 feet over here, the, the guy next to him has from here to here. Everybody has their share. That's the way you cover. You can't cover without focusing on just your spot. If I worry about doing what this guy does, what I'm supposed to be doing doesn't get done. I think too many times in the church we see situations where somebody is really willing to criticize somebody else's role. And the minute they do that, they drop the ball on their own. In fellowship and love as a church, we have to get together and do our parts, work together. So we do our own share. Now, in verse 7, 2 Timothy 2, 7, we need to remember our training. He says, reflect on what I am saying. The Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember what I told you. Remember the things that you know. Remember the truth that you have in your heart that you have grabbed a hold of. If you remember those truths, God will keep that growing in you. You will get better and better and better at what you're doing. If you remember where you start. Grab a hold of that basic fact. <coughs> when a soldier goes into the army, the first thing they do is to put him into basic training. Now, basic training in the military, in the army, specifically, is the same for everybody. I don't care if when you enlisted, you signed up to be a cook, or you signed up to be an infantryman, or you signed up for, like I was, for an interrogator. Jane, Jane was a reporter. Guess what? We all went through the same basic training. The same basic things are taught to everybody. How to tear down and fire an M16. How to, how to polish your boots, which today the kids have suede boots. Nobody has to polish them. I don't know what you do in basic training because we spent half our time polishing boots. I don't know what they do anymore. Learn how to brush the suede. I don't know. But that basic training, that elemental piece, 
is something you can always fall back on. That training took, took effect when I got into a situation where I was in a combat situation. Not everybody ever gets into that, but anybody could. When you get deployed and you go somewhere and, and you're going to be in a situation where you might get shot at, you will have to react. Whether you're a reporter or whether you're infantry or whether you're a cook. When I was in Mogadishu, we had missions that we would go out on. We went on intelligence gathering missions where we would drive into the city in places where nobody else would go. And we would go into places where the infantry wouldn't go. They would never put their people in that, in that kind of position, but we would go anyway. But the only way, the rule of, of the day was you had to have three vehicles. You couldn't go by yourself, you had to have three vehicles deep, and you had to have a cruiser weapon, a large weapon on one of the vehicles. There wasn't enough people in my team to, have, to man three vehicles. But our task was to go, but we didn't have enough. So we would draft other people to help us out. Sometimes infantry guys would come with us. Sometimes it was the cooks. We had the cooks go with us. We had guys from headquarters. We had motor pool guys who would get behind a machine gun and go out with us. Because the basic elements and the basic training was there. As Christians, we had the same thing. Many of us grew up in the church with young kids, right? We were young when we started. And guess what we had? We had the Bible stories that kids get, the Sunday school stories, right? We had the coloring books. We had all that kind of stuff. You ask any kid that grew up in the church, the story of Samson and Delilah, I don't know that one. Daniel and the lion's den, I don't know that one. You ask about Jesus feeding the multitudes with five, five loaves and two fish, they'll know that one. Those are the basics. Those are the ones everybody grabs a hold of. If you remember that, you can build on that. If you can remember the fact that God can do anything and has done everything already, that there's nothing beyond Him, that there's nothing that God can't do and nothing that God won't do, you can build on that knowledge, that basic knowledge, and become better and better as a believer, believer in Christ yourself. All of those things go back to our original training. That, that original training is priceless. It's absolutely priceless. But it can't do where we stop. If that's all you get, you're going to run out of knowledge pretty quick. If all of your faith is based upon the coloring books from Sunday school when you were in elementary school, and you stop developing, you're stopping your mission again. I think I've told you guys this before, that's one of the things Jane and I do with the youth group, is we go back to stories that they know and go into them deeper. I could do a series of sermons on Samson and Delilah up here and, and take you in places that coloring books don't go and to see some of the things that happen. We can do that ourselves by getting into the Word. We can see things, and that's where we get the insight from God. Go back to those things. Look at them again. Look at the basics. Look at the fundamentals and see what God says. You cannot read the Bible every day for your life and get bored. You can read it over and over, and every time God will open your eyes to something new, a new piece. I was telling Jane, I was reading Chronicles this week, and I went through all sorts of things, all the different people that David put in charge of different things, and I'll tell you right now, don't read every word of Chronicles because it's a list of names. Some of them are almost impossible to pronounce, and I'm going through them, and my eyes start to cross. But reading through that, I did pick up things. Do you know that he had people in charge of the flocks, people in charge of the herds, people in charge of this, people in charge of that? He had people in charge of donkeys, he had people in charge of camels, people in charge of flocks. <coughs> Didn't have anybody in charge of horses. Which kind of ties back, because Jane and I were talking just the other day about David winning these big battles and hamstringing all the horses in the back of the, of the people he beat. All those just little things. God just puts little bits of insight in there. It's like watching your favorite movie every time and picking up new stuff. If you take your basics and build on it, that's when God starts opening your eyes. That's when you get the special stuff. That's when you become the expert in your field. Now, verses 8 and 9. Oh, excuse me. 
First John 5 20 we also we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true that we are in him who is true by being in his son Jesus Christ he is the true God and eternal life if he's given us the understanding how many times do we see in the gospel where Jesus gives a parable and people aren't getting it and sometimes his disciples come can you explain that to us please and Jesus explains it to him and says, here, let me tell you what that means. There are things in your life that you won't understand, but if you go to God, God will say, here, let me tell you what that means. Let me explain that to you. Because, as Jesus said, some people's eyes are closed. They won't get it. They won't understand it. Some people will not understand it because they're not ready yet. They're not ready to learn that lesson. They're not ready to go that step. When they are, God will open their eyes. And they will see what's been right in front of them at all times. Now, verses 8 and 9. We need to remember what our purpose is. Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not changed. God's word is not chained up. You may get to the point where you feel like you are being chained up like a criminal, suffering, squeezed, pressed down. And Paul says, but God is not chained. He is not going to be stopped. You may feel like things are having, like you're having a hard time, but remember why you're there. Why are we here? We are here for the glory of God. We are here to further his mission. The last thing Jesus told us was, go forth and make disciples of all the world. Go forth. Go and make disciples of everyone. Share the gospel. Share it with people. And don't worry about it that you're not being strong enough because your purpose is still there and God will take care of the rest. We don't have to worry about the details. He's got the details. You just go. Jane and I were listening to a podcast not that long ago, and it was uh, an interview with um, Franklin Graham. And he talked about some of the things his dad did, Billy Graham. And he talked about meeting people who had been at his father's rallies. And some of them, he like there was one real famous one, I think it was in Los Angeles, where he set the tent up, and he was only going to speak so many nights. And he ended up being there for months. Because it just kept filling up night after night after night. People were so hungry and so thirsty for the word that they had to come and see him. And it, he just knew it wasn't time to move on yet. Because people kept coming. And talked about some of the people that came and, and how it changed their lives. But when we look at, at that, I want you to take that picture of the fact that, do you think Billy Graham worried about the light bill? <clears throat> whether or not the tent stakes were strong enough. Did he walk around and do that himself? No. God gave him a mission. His mission was stand up there and preach, and he did. And a lot of other little details were taken care of by other people to make that happen, and he probably didn't even know who they were. He was focused on his part of the mission and his goal, and no matter what happened, God's word was not changed. All he did was what God told him to do. And those lives were touched. Our lives can be the same thing. In the same way, we can do the same thing. If we remember where we came from and where we are going, what our goal is in the end, and keep in mind, wrapping it around ourselves, that our purpose is to take out the Word of God, and the Word of God cannot be defeated. That's when we win. Hebrews 12. 2 through 3. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. <coughs> if you need to find some reason to continue on your mission, if you're getting tired, if you're getting worn out, if you feel like everybody's beating you down, if you feel like you are being push back against. I want you to remember, the only reason we have the ability and the right to do any of this is through our salvation. Our salvation came 
through Jesus Christ, God made man here on earth who suffered beyond anything we'll ever have to suffer. Who did more than we can possibly do for ourselves. He did all those things so that we could get to work. So that we could be the soldiers we were meant to be. So if you forget where you're going, look at the cross. Bring yourself back to it. If you forget what you're doing, or you feel like it's too much, look at what Christ did for you. We went to my grandmother's funeral recently, and I'd heard this mentioned before by other people, and it didn't strike me nearly as hard as it did at that funeral. Her funeral was in a Catholic church. Beautiful church, great big thing. And at the front of it, or in front of the church, which is typical in Catholic church, they had a huge boot sticks up there. And sitting there at Grandma's funeral, I thought, boy, that's ironic. Because I look at this cross up here, and this is true. And that Catholic crucifix, Jesus is still up there. He's not up there anymore. Why do we have a picture of him up there? Well, it reminds us that he went there, but it doesn't bring the resurrection to mind. I see this empty cross, and that's what I think. He's not there anymore. He's in heaven. Because I'm not going to crawl up on this cross for myself, because it wouldn't work. He did it for me. I can go to heaven now. I can, I can finish my race the way I'm supposed to finish my race, because he finished his. I can't do it without him, but he did it all for me. He laid it down. He put the map down. He laid everything out in front of us, so that we cannot possibly misinterpret what we're supposed to be doing. Because he did it. He walked on this earth. We have four books in the, in the Bible just talking about the things he said and his life to give us guidance so that we can go forward. Now the last few verses I'm going to bring up. We're going to do ten and then we'll do a few more here. But In verse ten it says we need to endure for others, for our brothers. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. In 1 Peter 2.10, he also said, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are now in the family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ because we are adopted into the family. We are his sons and daughters. So that endurance that we show, those things, we endure everything for each other. Give each other strength. That picture in the background here, it might be a little hard to see. I kind of dim them down so it doesn't overwhelm. There are three soldiers there. The one in the middle is being carried by the two on the sides. Sometimes we need to pick each other up and carry each other. <coughs> sometimes I don't have to be just strong enough to go forward I need to be strong enough to carry someone who needs my help but I guarantee you without any doubt in my mind when this guy heals he'd be more than happy to carry this guy or that guy when he needs help in the military they call it brotherhood it's a, it's a, it's a band of brothers Christianity, it's the same thing. You guys are my brothers and sisters. And I have to trust that when I need it, you will help pick me up. And you have to trust that when you need it, so will I. We lean on each other. And if the weight that I'm carrying is heavy, but you need to be picked up, I'll add your weight to my weight anyway. Because Jesus picked that cross up and he carried it on his back. He carried it so that we can carry each other. This is part of our part of who we are as a community of believers. And when Peter is talking to Timothy about this, he's bringing that back up. We need to endure for the others. He says, I'm doing this not for myself. I'm not even sending you a letter for me. I'm sending you a letter for you. I do what I do to strengthen all of us. That's what Peter's telling Timothy. And that's our role too. We need to be arm in arm with each other. It makes, it makes it easier for us. But you also have to remember, if you stumble, 
and you hesitate and you hold back, there are a lot of eyes on you. And if someone else sees that and stops because of what you did, and then they stop, and then someone else stops, then we lose all our momentum and it starts to go away. There's a reason that there's empty churches in this town. Some of them so empty the buildings are abandoned. There's a reason for that. Somewhere along the line, all the forward momentum died. And it started sliding back down there, and it disappeared. The endurance wasn't there. Might have been a sprint to build a really pretty building, but it wasn't an endurance to finish the race. Verses 11, 12, and 13, Paul gives this statement to Timothy. He says, here is his trustworthy saying, If we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we also reign. If we disown him, he also disowns us. If we are faithful, he remains faithful. For he cannot disown himself. We look at these these little couplets here, that's what they're called in, in writing. They're called a couplet. We have this and then this and then this and then almost like poetry here. If then, if then, if then, if then. So there's a conditional followed by a, an answer to it. If we died with him, we will also live with him. So if you accept Christ into your heart, if he becomes part of who you are, you are in the death with him as well as the resurrection with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. Finish the race. That's what's meant. But, there's the warning, if we disown him, he will also disown us. But, again, even if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. There's our hope, there's our grace. Grace is mentioned right here. This is the grace. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He will never change. And the promises He gives are never removed. So if that's the case, that is our role, that is our step, that is what we're supposed to be doing. Even if we stumble and fall, He's still there. And He'll take you back. So this is a trustworthy saying. And that's where I'm, that's the last part of Paul I'm going to mention. But I want to bring this full circle now. And this is the role that we're meant to lead. I want to bring this full circle and I want us to do that self-evaluation again and see who we are and where we are and what we are. Because keeping our mind on the goal may not just be enough. We also have to think about what is the result of that goal. Where are we going? Why are we going to capture the flag on the top of the hill? Why are we going to take that territory and hold it? Why are we doing these things? We're doing these things because someday we're going to stand face to face with the creator of the universe and have to answer for what we did right here, right now, drawing the breath that we, we are drawing right now. You were born for a purpose. You were reborn in salvation for a purpose. God put us here for a reason. And in the end, you will have to stand up and be recognized for what you did or didn't do. So then the question comes, what do you want to hear when that happens? Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Is this what you want to hear? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from the evildoers. That's a scary statement there. I don't want to stand in front of God and have him say that to me. You can wave the flag, you can wear the t-shirts, you can do all those things, but if you are not committed firmly to Christ and doing what He wants us to do, we're not doing anything. But there's an alternative. This is the other thing. Matthew 25, verse 21. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So the question is, what do you want to hear? Picture in the background there is of an army uniform. And up on top you see those colorful things or ribbons. Awards that were won in the past. Things that were built up to this moment. And then right here, it's hard to see in the background here, is the award that that soldier just got. That star hanging off of his chest is the award that he just got. And what does that mean? That means he fulfilled his duty, he did an exceptional job of it, and he is recognized by his commander for what he did. And it's never been in exactly those words, but when they pin a medal on you like that, they're saying, well done, good and faithful servant. And the day will come when we will stand in front of God, and boy, do I want to hear that. And as much as I want to hear that, I want him to hear him say that to you. I want God to look into your eyes and say, oh, well done. So between now and that time, that's what we're all accounting for. And if right now you don't feel like you've made those steps forward, you haven't pushed forward, you haven't remembered your training, you haven't focused on what you need to focus on, you've hesitated to step forward into battle, you've hesitated to put yourself out there because of fear, if that's the case, well, God's faithfulness and His grace abounds enough for Him to say, okay, now get up and do your job. Don't hesitate anymore. Step forward. There was a time when I was a jump master, which is, in, in paratrooping terms, I was in charge of getting guys out of an airplane. They would run up with their parachutes and go out the door, and I was in charge of making sure it was safe and making sure everybody did the right timing and all those kinds of things. And everything is timed to the, to the barest little bit. There's a certain amount of space you have to drop people in, and they all have to get out of the plane at the right time. If somebody falls down, you got to stop everything. If somebody slows down, it can mess up everything. If a guy, if you're going to drop 50 people and the third guy slows way down, the last five might all get hurt. So they have to keep going. And there were occasional times, not very often, but occasional times when the bottom of my foot got a guy out the door. If he hesitated, I had to give him a push. I would kick somebody right in the seat of their pants and get him out that door so the next guy could come. And that was part of my job, was to keep pushing people through, keep them going so they can do their job and nobody else gets hit back. <laughs> Sometimes a swift kick in the pants is all you needed. I guarantee anybody who ever flew with me after that only got kicked once because they knew it was coming if they didn't just do it. So they just went. Sometimes we need to kick in the pants because we're hesitating, we're slowing down. Sometimes God needs, to, God, needs, God needs to give us that little bit, bit of a nudge to get us moving again. <coughs> Hopefully it only have, has to happen once. It has to give us that push. But for me, looking at these two passages in Matthew, that's all the motivation I need. Because I just think about standing face to face with Jesus Christ the author of my salvation, the bearer of my sins, and looking him in the eye, and he says, so what'd you do with the time I gave you? What'd you do, soldier? Where'd you been? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word, for our salvation. 